of the best in the country. And we were able to, with 87 amendments, kill that payday lending bill. And so I'm used to taking on power when it's appropriate, and I will stand up for regular folks' interest. Great, good question. Um, so starting on the dams, uh, my, my sense is, and this has been my perspective, is that 40% of this country's hydropower comes from our dams in the Columbia River Basin. Um, we get over 70% of our high, of our power in this state from renewables coming from hydro. And when it comes to the four lower Snake River dams, uh, our native salmon runs that have already, uh, salmon and steelhead that are already on the endangered species list are important to our you know, native communities in this state. Uh, they're important to our economic vitality. They're important to orca populations in the Puget Sound. And with the court ruling that came in last year, I support the, the, the fact that we need to have a really intensive environmental impact statement developed there uh, to look at whether the removal of those four lower Snake River dams collectively, which provide about 5% of our state's hydro, um, whether or not those should come out. I, I actually was very supportive of the, of the court ruling and believe that if, if we show that, that, that taking those four dams out would help restore wild salmon runs, that that's what we should do. Um, we've also seen some really interesting data come out recently from WSU that shows that dams actually also have met methane emitting effects. So we're actually seeing emissions coming just from having dams. So with those four lower Snake River dams, um, if that's what the environmental impact statement shows, I'm very glad that we're looking at that as a possibility on the table. And as a federal partner, I will work in partnership on what it means to re remove those dams, if that's what it comes to in 2018, and replace that with renewable energy sources. Um, on the Yakima River Basin Plan, I've spent a lot of time meeting with constituents about it because interestingly enough, there are a lot of constituents in the 43rd District who have pretty strong perspectives about it. Um, I have real concerns about the Yakima River Basin Plan for a number of reasons and actually wrote a letter to Congressman Dave Reichert about it on behalf of some constituents about eight months ago. And, and I, I don't think that the agreement that's been reached there is going to be the right one. Um, in the state budget, our state capital budget chair in this last session, there were discussions around state capital budget funds going into supporting the Yakima River Basin Plan, and I have real concerns with it. So in Congress, I will ask hard questions about the plan. And then we'll the last- another 30 seconds. Each of you- Oh, sure, sure, 30 sure. Seconds. On and the then last the, one. the last question, I feel like I'm doing this one right now, actually, with Initiative 732. Um, we're seeing in the state, um, it's a tough one. And it's one where you have a lot of interests on both sides of this issue. And for me, it, it took a lot of introspection and really thinking through, is this the right step on climate change today, given with what we're being faced with on the ballot? And I decided, yes, I will be voting for 732. Um, and it's in contrast to uh, Senator Jayapal listed the groups, the State Democratic Party, a lot of others who have lined up against the initiative. So I am voting for it. And, and you know, there's a group of us, four or five environmental legislators in the State House who have supported it. So that, that's an area that, that I'm standing up at the moment. So we got a couple of questions about civility. Go, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask if we could have a little bit more time on 732 or if that was appropriate. I think, Do you want to stop? Okay. Yeah, and you have a close. Sure. Okay. Yeah. But but and we can get back to it. You you may get an opening here on my next question. Okay. Okay. Um, because there are two questions here about civility in Congress and how difficult it is and how divided and polarized the country is. There's also a question here about the specific policy differences that separate you. And and I think that's always this tension, right? Every candidate is going to say we're really great at working together, but we're also really good at standing for things. So let me see if I can. You can go wherever you want with this question. Yeah. Sorry to long leave it. But sometimes it feels it looks like there's a, a separation within the Democratic Party itself is divided. And is there a division in the Democratic Party? You know, if so, what are the two sides and what side are you on? And how does that affect your ability to get things done in Congress? So go for it. And if you want to, you know, just go go down. Look, I mean, I, I are there two sides of the Democratic Party? What are they? And what side are you on? I hey I Hey, I, I kind of agree with the premise of the question. So I, I don't- I, You can I, fight the premise. All right, I'll fight the premise a little bit there. So um, first of all, I'll just say, I, I believe we need more bridge builders in Congress. And I, I say this as someone who, this has been my ethos in public service. It's why I went into it. It's this belief for me that we need people who are in office 
who are able to work to find common ground. And my story of driving across the Cascades is not just a nice story. I mean, for me, that is, is how I approach legislation. It's how I approach bridge building. It's how I approach common ground, having grown up in one of the most conservative communities in Washington State, where nine in 10 people voted against the relationship my husband and I have. Um, so this is a core issue for me. So when, when we talk about kind of two sides to the Democratic Party, um, there are many, many times <laughs> Uh, when I, I have very strong feelings about health care reform, I, mean, I, I support single payer. I think we need to be doing very kind of deep financial sector reform. I, I believe that strongly. Um, I believe that we need to be taking bold and decisive action on climate change with a federal carbon tax immediately. So I mean, those, those represent what you, know, you may characterize as one kind of flank of the Democratic Party. Um, but ultimately, I, I, I believe that the Democratic Party um, needs to move in that direction of embracing more of those values. Um, that's my perspective. And I also, I also think, though, that all the while, a lot of the achievements we've made in this state, when I look at the work that we've done on mental health and criminal justice reform and opiate addiction and, and, and housing affordability and homelessness at the state level that we need to do more on locally, um, when I look at those issues, in divided government, it's come from building relationships that have been able to actually make meaningful <coughs> progress, but never losing sight of, of really the systems change that we need to see. So I would say I'm an organizer. I always have been. And I fundamentally <coughs> believe that you create change when you build a big enough movement to create that change. And Standing Rock is that way. Immigration reform is that way. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily there's two sides of the Democratic Party. There's certainly a conservative Democratic Party and a liberal Democratic Party. So across the spectrum, you've got, you know, you've got a lot of differences. But what I do think is that each of us often operate in silos, right? The environmental <coughs> movement is separate. Racial justice is separate. Women's issues are separate. Um, labor is separate. And my whole life has been about where those intersections are. I like to say I'm not a woman on Monday, an immigrant on Tuesday, a mom on Wednesday, and a worker on Thursday. I'm all of those things all of the time. And when you look at my track record and how I would operate in Congress, I have always been able to work with unlikely allies, but also bring folks together in our own movement. So when I took on immigration reform back in 2002, the AFL-CIO had just changed its position on immigration. They were isolationist until 2000. They were against immigration reform. And the Democratic Party didn't have it on its platform. It was not there. People forget that now because everybody's for immigration reform now. We had to build the movement and convince people that workers' rights was not separate from immigrant rights. And so I'm really proud that we did that by lifting up workers, by lifting up immigrant workers, and by really making the case for why this was something for all of us. In 2005, when domestic partnerships were, when the state Supreme Court was going to um, review the domestic partnerships law, Hate Free Zone, the organization I started now called One America, was the only organization to sign on to the amicus brief for domestic partnerships. And I came back to the office like, hey, this is great, civil rights issue, that's what we're about, civil rights. And what I found is in my own movement of immigrants that we had a lot of staff members who were Latino and Muslim who were not for gay marriage and not for domestic partnerships and really upset that we had taken that stand. It never occurred to me that that would be the case, but when I saw it was, we committed to a five-year deep organizing project to build understanding within immigrant communities about how LGBTQ issues are immigrant issues and that we have these deep intersections. And because of that, when gay marriage was on the ballot, the Seattle Times wrote about how One America had played such a pivotal role in bringing immigrants to the table on gay marriage. That is what I think we need to do on climate change, and that is why I think it would be so dangerous to allow 732 to go forward when communities of color who have been left out for so long are not at the table deciding the solutions. We cannot say that we are for Black Lives Matter and getting rid of institutional racism, except when it's too much time to wait to get them on board. I really believe this strongly, and I'm not saying anything against the people that put 732 together. I think it was a great effort, but I think we need to take a step back and remember that we are all better off when we're all better off. 
And when we have everybody at the table, that is when we build the power to take on the biggest fossil fuel providers because that is the real problem. So Pramila was on a roll, so I didn't interrupt him. You got an extra minute to work with now or later? I'll hold it. I'll okay. bang it. <laughs> I'll bang it. No, it's okay. I just want to be fair because I do think it's important for you to Such say your piece. No, I'll bang it. The audience here. That's very important to me. Um, boy, um, we covered a lot of ground there. I want to do, what's our hard stop? We started a little late, but what's your hard stop, candidates? 7.45, I think whenever the time was, when are we in? 7.45 is what we said, it's 7.42. Mm -hmm. 7.50? I, I, I get the extra minutes, maybe 7.51. <laughs> okay, then we're gonna do, I'm, we're gonna get through the questions, and, but you're gonna, um, you're gonna get, uh, you know, 30 seconds or 45 seconds each, we'll just knock them off. That way I will cover every question, I believe. Um, do you consider yourself a feminist? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I've got Gloria Stein with me, and Emily's List, and Planned Parenthood, and all of the women's organizations. Absolutely, and I always have. And I, I believe that, I mean, I believe that feminism has also been part and parcel to why the LGBT rights movement has gotten to where it is. And I, I think about feminism, and I've been very involved with a group called the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund for years <laughs> that inspired me to run into public office. And one of the pieces that's so important to me there is the role that the feminist movement played in supporting LGBTQ equality for so many years. So absolutely, I'm a feminist. Okay, we've got 45 extra seconds now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would you um, address Black Lives Matter and racial injustice? And let's say a, a minute on this one. First of all, Black Lives Matter. And I, I believe that the movement for Black Lives Matter has produced so many extraordinary and important discussions in this country. And I'll say one thing that I have felt been so lucky to have the chance to work on. Over the last few years, I've had the chance to work with uh, Blackout, with the Black Prisoners Caucus, with a lot of groups inspired by Black Lives Matter on navigating some really important criminal justice reforms. This last year, um, with support from and with testimony from many groups involved with Black Lives Matter, um, passed legislation called the Certificate of Restoration of Opportunity, which in this state today opens up hundreds of thousands of jobs that were previously closed to people who had a conviction in their past. So if, if you'd happened to have shoplifted a few times when you were 19, um, you couldn't be a bartender today. And, and this law changes that. It opens up nursing assistant jobs. It opens up uh, longshoremen, uh, jobs that help people get back on their feet because we know that 8,000 people come out of prison every year in Washington State. Within a year, 43% of those individuals are reincarcerated. So I care very, very deeply about criminal justice reform and drug reform. And when I look at the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it has been extraordinary in helping create more political space that has allowed for me as a legislator to be able to be a partner um, and build the bridges and even bring colleagues from across the aisle on board to make really important gains in improving the criminal justice system in the state. So I don't know how many of you know this, but Black Lives Matter was created by three queer black women. Um, and so a lot of people think it was a, a black men movement, but it was actually created by some amazing women who are dear friends of mine. A couple of them are very dear friends of mine. Um, I don't know if people remember the rally for Social Security and Medicare back in the fall when Bernie Sanders was here and was supposed to speak. Um, and after that rally, I wrote a piece called um, why, the, why the Rally Left Me Heartbroken. It was published in The Stranger and then made, it way, made its way nationally. And one of the things I talked about there was the deep injustice that still exists and institutionalized racism that exists in all of our systems and how difficult it has been and how long people have waited um, and how close we are actually to slavery and lynching and many other horrendous things in this country that require us to talk about race and shortly after that I wrote a piece in the nation called I'm a state senator and I'm not afraid to talk about race um, this is a very difficult topic for us, but we have to engage with it. Black Lives Matter is not just about a policy solution. It is, of course, about taking on the criminal justice system and ending the for-profit prison system. It is, of course, about the sh killing of black men uh, and women across the country and the fact that a black mother has to literally text her son every day to find out if he came home from school at night but it is at the core about whether we allow respect, dignity, safety, and opportunity 
for people regardless of what color they are. And that is built into every single system. So you can't look at a transportation system and not see racism. You can't look at climate and not see racism. You can't look at education and not see racism. You have to be willing to address that without feeling like we're calling people racist, because that's not what's happening. We all have implicit biases in us, but if we're gonna talk about this conversation, we are, if we're gonna move forward on this conversation, we have to talk about it. And we have to utter the words, not just Black Lives Matter, but institutional racism. And we have to be willing to challenge it when we see it. How do you plan to represent young voters, an increasingly larger demographic in Seattle, when you make your way to capital vote? Younger voters. So, um, I think I'm first. Um, I'm thrilled that we won young voters in a really big way in the primary, and it's uh, demonstrated in our campaign, too that um, we have a thousand volunteers in the campaign. We have tons of young people, people who have never been involved in politics before. We've knocked on over 300,000 doors, knocked on and talked to people on the phones for over 300,000 voters. And to me, it is about making sure that they have a place at the table. So at One America, we created a One America Youth and we gave them the leadership. In the state senate, I've hired young people, people of color, women, because we need to make sure that we are really putting voters at the front. So we are training our next generation of leadership. And we had 94 Nathan Hale students who signed up the other day to volunteer for our campaign. They've been out knocking, they are learning about politics, and they are learning that their voices really matter, that it is really important for them to engage in democracy. So we've had a great time with the young folks. They really energize all of us, and they make us all feel um, like we're in high school again. <laughs> Lovely, on the most, for the most part. <laughs> One thing that's been great. Before you go, oh yeah, I want you to answer that question, and then we'll write into your minute and a half press. Oh great. Okay. Two and a half minutes. Okay. Excellent. So I uh, one thing that has been great on the campaign is that there have been a lot of high schoolers involved in it. And I walked into our field office about two weeks ago, and some of the high schoolers who were volunteering on our campaign were saying they were having debates about this campaign in their high school hallways. With, with high schoolers who are volunteering on Senator Jayapal's campaign. Yeah. So that's democracy, right? I mean, that's the kind of civic dialogue we want to be creating. And I am running for Congress as a young person. Um, and I am running for Congress as someone who would be um, the youngest House Democrat in the next cycle. Um, and I'm running for Congress as someone who would be one of the first millennials in Congress. And I'm doing that because I'm part of a generation um, of people who were saddled by student debt. My husband and I are still paying off our student debt. Part of the most asset poor generation in US history who will see both the impacts of climate change if we don't act today and feel the urgency of climate change. And at the same time, if we don't fix and expand programs like social security, won't have a secure retirement. So I, I believe strongly in the role and the need for new energy and youth in our political system. Um, and it's why I went into politics. I left, I left doing something very different to go into public service because of that really strong belief. Um, so with that, should I transition? Go, keep rolling, man. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, well, I'll stand up now. Once you're closed now. <laughs> so I, have left the closed uh, 45 seconds. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, my commitment to you, uh, as I've had my commitment to the people I've served in the 43rd District, is I'm a listener. I'm a bridge builder. Um, I'm so proud to come into this race with the support of, if you speak to people who've worked with me in the past in state government, my colleagues, uh, they'll describe me as a coalition builder, someone who brings people together, someone who's a workhorse, someone who rolls up their sleeves and has very strong progressive values, but also someone who's able to get things done. Um, and I'm running to be your, your representative um, for the next 10, 15, however long I'm in office, but you know, those, that period of time, this is such an important decision here for our home in the Northwest. And the other piece that I want to share with you is that in electing me, you'll be electing someone who will be a climate champion, who will think about climate and environmental change every day, and will put this, the struggle and the push to respond to our changing climate front and center. And the last piece is that I'm running because of the local needs that we have here in the Northwest. Um, I think we need a federal partner here, someone who's going to be our partner to the University of Washington for basic science someone who's gonna be our partner to the infrastructure in our port, someone who's gonna be a partner in getting a high-speed train to connect Seattle to Vancouver in 57 minutes, which is possible with federal partnership. And those are the kind of big ideas we can think of from the Northwest. And when I come back here in two years, what I want you to hold me accountable for 
is I believe the federal government needs an immediate response to homelessness. Um, I think it's something that we have failed our communities on for decades, and it's time for the federal government to have an immediate response to communities for homelessness. So I'm so honored to be here. Um, I've had wonderful support from across so many different parts of the community on the campaign, and I would be hugely, hugely honored by your vote in 21 days, or tomorrow, actually, when you get your ballot. <laughs> 21 days. <laughs> That's the beauty of Washington State. So thank you, and I'm just delighted to be here with all of you in Greenwood. Seconds or 90, 90, seconds. 90 seconds? Yeah. He got um, the one minute for the answer, then the next Got it. Um, so, thank you all so much for being here. This is the best part um, of the campaign in many ways. We get to meet all these wonderful new people. And I am so honored to have had the opportunity to serve this community in so many different ways and produce results for Seattle from the $15 minimum wage to voter registration to immigration. Um, and in the state Senate to be able to take on some really critical issues in a Republican controlled Senate, which is very, very different than passing legislation. But I'm also really proud to be somebody who thinks about how we bring all of these issues together. You know, everybody wants to know what the one issue is that you're gonna work on. But I'll tell you, when I'm knocking on doors, and we've talked to 300,000 voters across this district, door to door, person to person, what I hear is not one issue. What I hear is they're concerned about the fact that their kids are $40,000 in debt on average to go to college. We need free college for our kids because that's an investment. What I hear is that people are afraid that they're not gonna be able to retire in, in dignity and they're not gonna be able to pay for what they do when they get old. That is really important that we expand Social Security. People are afraid that these big fossil fuel companies are gonna destroy the earth for the next generation. I have a 19 year old. I know what that means to pass on something to our next generation. And that is really important that we take on. And finally, that this economy is rigged, not the way Trump is talking about it, but in the way that Trump is doing, the way that he is using the tax system to take resources out of our economy and to screw the people at the very bottom. And so fundamentally, I am somebody who is going to work on all of those issues. I've been tested and tried in the fire. And when you send somebody to Congress, you don't know what the next issue is going to be. You don't know whether there's going to be another 9-11 or whether there's going to be a Donald Trump emerging or whether there's going to be a war in Iraq. And my history is of standing up for what is right and building the movement to actually make real change possible. So I would be incredibly honored by your support, by your vote, and um, by the opportunity to serve what I believe is one of the most beautiful places in the United States and one of the most beautiful countries in the world that gave me the opportunity to come here as a 16 year old by myself and to now run for the United States Congress. And I would be, by the way, while we make history electing the first woman in the White House, you could elect the first woman in the district and the first South Asian American woman ever elected to Congress. So thank you. So much. Okay, now we have the, the next event, so you guys oh, okay. can yeah. okay. the release. <laughs> Thank you all. Maybe a couple of minutes left. Thank you. 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 Thank you.